G'day everybody and welcome to another episode of Automotive Carnage. Today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into our HG Holden Bram here and find out is the 308 that's still in this car worth repairing or do we just go ahead and swap it out for an LS1 or maybe we swap it out for the mighty Barra. I don't know, let's find out. G'day everybody, my name's DJ and thank you for joining us on this episode of Automotive Carnage. As I said before, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into our HG Holden Brown that we debuted on the channel uh, last episode. Our new projects, well, I say new, but this car is actually 53 years old. That is absolutely amazing for it to be in such a great condition, considering it's 53 years old and we actually have no idea how long it has been sitting out in the bush. So if you remember from that episode, which was an absolutely overwhelming positive response, I thought we'd better dig a little bit deeper and show you a bit more that's going on with this car. So we're going to start with the 308 that is in here. If you remember, it has a hole in the sump. So we're going to rip that out and uh, see if the damage, strip it down as best we can and see if the damage is repairable or if the block is going to be thrown away. Now, if it's going to be turfed or if it's uneconomic to repair then we have these options in front of us now don't worry stop freaking out we're not going to put the barra into this amazing car um, you've all said in the comments below the last video how much you want to see this thing restored back to original condition and uh, more on that later as to why that may or may not be an option so i'm leaning towards an ls1 now i'm not a huge fan of ls1 conversions um, mainly because they've just been done and they've been done because they're a great engine and they make awesome power for a relatively cheap price. So um, this is out of a WH Statesman. We got the whole car for 400 bucks and all I wanted was that part. I mean, as much as I don't like pulling LSs into cars, um, when, a car, when you know, it's 400 bucks, you're stupid to say no. So anyway, let's uh, get this bonnet off and start diving in and see if we can pull this engine out. Here we are at the business end of our Holden Brahm, and in front of you we have a fantastic 308, which when we look at the engine code is a 308H, so it is a period correct engine, which is absolutely really good and does lead towards the idea that this may be the original engine to this car. So that's really awesome. So today we just want to try pull this out, and as you can see it's been cannibalized quite a bit, so it actually means it's going to be fairly easy. All I've got to left to undo is the engine mounts, one on either side. The transmission's already gone, the exhaust has already been chopped off, all the linkages for the carby's gone, because, well, there's no carby. And uh, so we've got a couple of power steering lines here that we just cut through those. And that's about it. And in actual fact, I think the rubbers are so dry and cracked on the engine mounts, I don't think we have to undo the bolts. So we'll, uh, we'll get this bonnet off, we'll take it off nicely, we'll get the forklift in here, and we'll just try to lift this out and, um, and see what stays behind. Let's get into it. Well, that has to be one of the easiest engine removals I have ever done. I mean, someone else has already done all the hard work by removing the uh, transmission for us and disconnecting the exhaust and the drive shafts. And look, the weather has even completely eroded these rubber engine mounts just as I thought they would have. So there's still a little bit of sponge. They're not as hard as I thought, actually, but they are completely knackered, so we didn't have to undo those. And now, we'll get out of the sun here, we have our 308 out and hanging in all its glory. So. I haven't looked at this yet. I thought, why not look at it together for the first time? So this is the first hole that I was telling you guys about. So yeah, the sun's pretty low, so sorry about the shadows, but that is pretty nasty. Now, what's good though, is there's no visible 
cracks, although it is pretty dirty, and no visible holes in the block itself. So that's good. We have a lot of rust here. So this has been through a few floods. Um, so that means, so I'm actually surprised the floor on this is so good if the sump is looking like that. So I reckon the Y-frames will be cactus. Um, let's have a look on the other side here. Dizzy's gone. We still have a flywheel, a bit of a wasp nest going in there. Okay, we're gonna get these on the engine stand. We're gonna have to clean out these holes here. So I'm not gonna have to strip this down as soon as I thought. We're gonna do a bit of tidy up first. Okay, over this side. So, ah, oh, now look, there we go. Another uh, massive hole from engine parts that tried to get out. So yeah, something's definitely gone on at the back half, back side, back side, the rear, I should say, of the crank. Very interesting. We got a crack through the manifold there by the looks of it. Otherwise, they appear to be in okay condition. And again, we've got more rust right across the front there of the sump underneath is okay. So yeah, frost plug, yeah, that's okay. Not too bad. So I'm really stoked about that. I was really worried that there's gonna be actual holes in the block itself, but this may be saveable. So we'll, um, we'll get it onto, get cleaned up a little bit, get it on an engine stand, and then we'll start stripping it down. All right, folks, here we are. We have our engine sitting on its back at the moment. Uh, we've loosened off all the sump bolts and we're going to pull this off and, uh, and see what all this damage at the bottom here is all about. Now, yes, I did say that I was going to put this onto an engine stand and do it that way. But uh, then I realized that I um, actually don't have any of the correct size bolts to be able to bolt it on and secure it down safely. So this will do for now. Um, Actually, after looking at it, all we really need to do anyway is to take the sump off, and that should give us an idea of what is happening under there in the rotating assembly. It should be very, very interesting. I see through here that um, I don't want to look too much because I want to uh, have a look again with you at exactly the same time. So we've had to bash around a little bit of the hole on this side so we can access one of the nuts on that side. So I'm just going to go around now, just quickly undo all these bolts. I, um, I thought that, hey, I'll do this while talking, and I forgot to undo that one. Uh, and uh, I could be like really smooth and suave, but that's just, it's taking longer than I expected. So um, please wait while I just fast forward this last bit. Alrighty, that is the last bolt out of the sump. So hopefully a gentle tap we should be able to get this off. Oh, I don't think we're going to need to tap it too much. There we go. What have we got behind door number one? A lot of... Whoa! Whoa! Okay. Um, that's not where you put your con rod. <laughs> wow. That's cool. Okay, let's start number one. Looks good, two, good, three, good, four. Yeah, wow, look at the pickup, oh my gosh. So definitely had lots of water flowing through here. These all look good, still see a cam in there. And then yeah, wow, what has gone on here? So the very last piston, or last conrod, sorry, has just exploded. And there is bits of bearing, look, there's the, Collar, collar, pin, anyway. Um, what are these? Is that a part of a liner or a part of a piston? I'm not too sure there. Um, radio. Yep, conrod bolt. Wow, just all sorts in here. So yeah, there's the actual conrod. And that is munched, absolutely munched. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, don't know where the piston is, unless that's the piston, or degraded into these tiny little pieces. Um, could explain why, yeah, there's lots of these rounded big chunks of metal like this. Uh, right, so can we see? Let's get what's, what's anything, anything else in here of interest. No, uh, just uh, lots of rust in there. Wasp mist. Yep, cool. That's what everyone needs in their engines these days. 
All right, let's get a torch and see if the piston's still in there and uh, see if we can figure out if the sidewalls are any good. Timing chain looks good. That's nice and clean. Yeah, the piston is still in there, so. So you go, can you guys see the piston in there? Yeah. But the actual, get some light coming from this way. The actual sidewall doesn't look too bad. Interesting, so it might be worth saving the old girl. So yeah, I think if we are going to put a new engine into this Bram, I definitely am leaning towards that LS. And uh, mainly because it's just a more modern engine, it's more reliable, more power, and um, parts are just very plentiful. But um, yeah, for all the ones who want this car to be original, let's go back over to the vehicle now, and I'll, um, I'll dive into why that is potentially not possible. Back over at the Bram now, and oh, hello there. What have we got here? That looks like a 351 Cleveland. I think that fits in there quite nicely, actually. I mean, that's definitely an option to put a put in here and repower it. No, don't worry, I'm not that sacrilegious. I'm not gonna put a 351 Cleveland into a Bram. Yeesh, I care about the car a bit too much to put a Ford motor in there. Ugh. Anyway, but it does look good in there. So the reason I feel this car will never be original is because someone has already come along and helped themselves to the identification tags of this car. The HGs are meant to have three ID tags and a chassis number stamped into the firewall. And while the stamped firewall's still there, there's a tag on that side which gives us our another chassis code but the actual id tags that tell us what engine what diff what transmission what color what trim they're gone and a it's highly illegal to do that you cannot take tags off of vehicles so when you go out bush or you go looking for old wrecks please stop taking tags off because you never know 20 30 years time some lunatic might pull one out of the bush and try and restore it so because we don't have the id tags we can only guesstimate what this car actually was when it was built 53 years ago. You know, in 53 years, a lot of things can happen. Engines can be changed, transmissions can be changed, colors can be changed. So even though this color on here looks absolutely amazing, has a great patina, there's no way of knowing for sure if this is the original color or if those door cards are actually correct. So at the most, we could guesstimate this car back to about 80% originality but you will never know 100% for sure that you have a beautifully clean Bram, clean Bram. And for that reason, in my opinion, this vehicle fully restored, absolutely smicko back to original would be worth no more than forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Cause would you want to buy a Bram that doesn't have any tags on it? Now you can get it registered, you can get them road legal without the tags, but the extra paperwork you have to go through, is it really worth it? I don't know. So if we can't go original, or it's not economic to go original, what do we do? And that's where I love the idea of a resto mod. Let's take this beautiful body that we still have. We still have great panels that are gonna be very easy to fix. We still have a lot of glass. Yes, we're gonna need a windscreen, but that's, I mean, it's an HG holder. There's nothing special about it. Let's take what we have that looks absolutely amazing and let's make it run like a modern car. Let's whack the LS1 in there with a nice four-speed transmission fly-by-wire, new diff at the rear end, disc brakes up the front, modern disc brakes at the front, and let's make this vehicle usable, you know? Instead of just going, oh, nah, hands up, it's too much work, why not? We found it in the bush anyway. It was sitting out on the Northern Territory border, rusting away, doing nothing, so why not put a modern engine in it and let people enjoy it the way it is and let it continue to tell its story? So yes, I know that sounds like a bit of a rant, but there were so many comments about turning this car back to original condition, I felt like I really had to address that. And also, I realized last episode, I actually didn't share the photos of how this car was originally found back on that Northern Territory border, like I said. So I'll take a couple of photos in here now, and this is exactly how my friend found the vehicle. He took these photos, and um, yeah, when we found out what it was, we were absolutely fab, 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 amazed flabbergasted ha flabbergasted absolutely amazed at just the condition that it was in so really awesome awesome find so with all that being said let's get this four junk out of here move along and uh let's go about making this vehicle into a rolling chassis which is what i love doing making these cars roll steer again so yeah we'll put some new tires on these rims we'll go find what we need to connect the tie rod end to the hub on the passenger's side there. We now have an HK that has the parts we need, so we'll go nick those. And um, yeah, let's see if we can make this thing rolling and steering. 
Righto folks, here we are in the Outback again, looking for the parts that we need to make that Brahm into a nice rolling chassis. So we're looking for what we have decided to dub the Knuckle Tie Rod Holder Army Thingy. I can't remember the actual name for it, so if you know, let us know in the comments down below. But anyway, this is the HK that I was telling you all about, and um, there was two issues that I thought we would have. One being that with the Brahm being disc brake front end and everything else out here being drums, they might be slightly different. And also the fact that the Brahm has power steering and a lot of these cars don't. But even more of a problem than that is the fact that someone's already been here and beaten us to the hub. So absolutely everything is gone. And that's going to be a pretty common theme between the vehicles that we go and suss out today. Because a lot of the hubs get used onto the trailers from back in the day. So... This HK to us is going to be no good, but what we can learn is from this side here on the driver's side, it still does have the knuckle tie rod arm hollery thingy, and we measured the two bolts and the spacing between those, which is about 95 millimeters, give or take, being that that's a metric of measurement and those are imperial sizing on everything in these, and these are actually similar, so that's a really good start. The, yeah, so the, the, the mounting points for our arm are the same between the disc brake and the drums, which is absolutely fantastic. So we'll keep going for a little ticky tour. I know there's another HG wagon that might have what we're after, and also an HT, I think, which has the seats that I would love to take out and put into the Brahms. So we'll head to that one next. Just before we head off to that HT, there's something I want to address. It's not something that comes up very often, but um, it is kind of one of the stigma questions that I get asked occasionally, and that is, do you stage the cars that you find? Well, the answer is no, quite literally. If we look out there, that is the road. That is a sealed road going into the town where I live. There's the HK. So, you know, I didn't put that car there. The, the cars that I find, they are as we found them. Um, if I do work on a vehicle that we put in a certain position, I'll let you guys know for sure. Anyway, let's go to the HT. Okay, here we are at the second car, and what I thought was an HT is actually just another HK, so my apologies there. Anyway, we want um, a few things off this car. As you can see down here, we still have the knuckle in place, and it does have the knuckle tie rod arm holdery thingy there. So we're going to jack it up out of the mud and grab that. But also, what we find in this car is these seats, which look like pretty standard um, HK, HT bucket seats, until we do that. They're Monaro seats. So we're definitely taking those home. Uh, whether we take them home today or not, I'm not too sure. We'll see how hard they are to actually get out. And uh, the, the foam's obviously gone and the springs are a bit how you're going, but we do know upholsterers. So Dan, you're gonna help me uh, recover these seats, I reckon. Um, anyway, we'll get into action here. We'll jack this up. We'll get the part that we need. It should only be three nuts, you know, famous last words. Um, got a couple of helpers here. We've got uh, Tim and Jaden with me, so they're going to be uh, the extra people you see hovering around. But first things first, someone's literally sh** on a Holden, so we're going to have to move that first because it's right in our work area. Anyway, let's get into it. Yep, let's drive away. Keep on going. Yeah. Handbrake on, hold it there. Wow, that floor is um, not in good condition. I don't think we can use that. The diff's still here, I didn't notice that. I was only in the housing though, someone's already taken all the axles. Two bar. Two bar. So how's that for flipping your first car? Yeah, that was fun. Yeah? I want to do it again. I know, that's why I love it, man. Look, kind of addictive. We have to show you guys Outback Drag Racing. Sounds yep. good to me. Yeah. Drag anyway, racing. back to the job at hand. Let's get the seats out. Okay, so if for further investigation, A, we were just snapping all the bolts off, which is not surprising considering how rusty they were. Uh, B, these ones are just spinning around in their spot. But more importantly, if we come over this way, the actual frame itself, is so worn out and rusted that um, by the time we get them out, there's not going to actually be much of a seat base left to use. So, unfortunately, they will just sit here and uh, return back to Mother Earth. 
Anyway, we've got what we need, so we'll head back to the Brahm, stick it on there, and uh, see what happens. Alrighty, here we are, back at the Brahm. And um, we kind of sort of measured up the distances, but we honestly have not put this on yet. I thought we'll uh, bring you along to see whether we get disappointed or not. Will an HK knuckle tie rod holdery thingy fit an HG Brahm? Ha! <laughs> yes, it will. Yes. Boom! It's on, where's those nuts? Show me your nuts. Thank you, sir. I love having a near endless supply of car parts in the bush. Of all places. Oh, cool. Let's just turn the whole bolt. So, the bolts that hold it all together have let us down and they're just spinning around in the spot. So, we're going to have to take the caliper off, take the hub off so we can get a socket onto the end. We need that just to clean all the gunk out. Alright, side cutters to pull out and we'll probably need a shifter. Hopefully there's one in there. No. This is weird. Nothing's ever oh, loose in the bush, man. So good. <laughs> Everything's always a bloody struggle, but these Holdens, it's like they want to fall apart. So good. <laughs> they were like the bee's knees back in the 60s. Oh, there's still grease in there. <laughs> One in. All right, so the problem we're having now, um, it's going swimmingly, swimmingly until this point, where the thread on the actual tie rod end is just destroyed, so I don't have an imperial size free cleaner. I don't even have a wire brush, I don't think. Uh, no, so we're just gonna pretty much ram this nut on until it's on. And I'll regret that. Future me will regret that. Now, after about 45 minutes of playing with that thread, we finally got this. Let me bring you in and show you what has happened. So we managed to get it on. It is on upside down, but you know, it's on now. So that's the main thing. That's not going anywhere, which means we now have steering. Uh, luckily a good friend of mine rocked up. He had a UNF uh, die nut, which helped out considerably to clean up that thread. So without that, we will still be struggling multiple hours later. So the next thing to do is uh, get these rims and get some tires on it. But as you can see, Sun's starting to go down, so we might leave that for another day. But next time you see this, it will be sitting nicely on its wheels and actually able to steer. And how good does the Brahm look now? It is always such an amazing point of the build or the restoration, whatever you want to call it, when we get the car up out of the dirt and rolling and steering properly. As you can see, we have moved locations. So the steering works absolutely wonderfully now, even with our upside down castle nut on there. And at this point, really, it's just about getting this car mobile so that we can get it down to either someone else to restore it. Or I think what we'll do with this car for now is we'll just tuck it away in a little container and um, we'll just have it hiding away until we're finished with the pacer. And then we might look at revisiting and actually doing the work on this. Now, this episode has been quite of a journey. We start off with deciding what engine we want to put into it then discussing why this car will never be 100% original and then finally we went out bush found some amazing parts uh, just lying around out there and um, got this thing rolling and steering as you see it now and as you can see from the heights on the front we have taken the 351 Cleveland out of there so you can relax about that and um, yeah I think now we'll just sit here until we're ready to move it down to the new location the headquarters and um, yeah, as I say we'll tuck away in the container and um, save it for a rainy day Anyway, thank you so much for joining this episode of Automotive Cars. We hope you stay tuned for the next episode. Until then, we'll catch you later.